Uh, Jan Good promised to give an introduction so that everybody can follow the machine. Okay. Also, give an introduction to the introduction if this is necessary. So, uh, this talk is supposed to be a sort of a report on the point of departure for a project that I'm about to pursue. Uh, so the project will be about generalizing the goldberg sachs theorem from general relativity. So what I want to talk about today is simply what the theorem is and how one can prove it in a slightly different way than uh, the usual one. So here's the theorem, let's start with it, from 1961, and it tells you that a vacuum space-time is algebraically special if and only if it admits a sheer free congruence of null geodesics. So I have to explain all those terms. So, uh, Rather slow. Yeah, and please tell me how deep I should go into each of those. So what is a vacuum space-time? This is a Lorentzian four-dimensional manifold. Uh, which satisfies the vacuum Einstein equations, so such that the Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric tensor. So I'm going to stay on that level. I hope this is sort of acceptable. I don't want to go below that. Now, what is this algebraic specialty? I'm going to get deeper into that in a moment, but now I'll just say that to say that the space time is algebraically special is the same as to say that the vile curvature tensor uh, is algebraically special, which means that it has a special Petrov type, and I will tell you what those Petrov types are. But a good analogy uh, from... Uh, it, it's it's from concerning the first point, so the normal empty space yes. is Minkowski space. Is, yes. Minkowski space, is vacuum space. Yes. yes. Good. So this is like proportional to zero times metric. Yes. yes. Yeah, but, yeah, but that one, uh, the proportionality yes. is equal to zero. Yes. That's right. yeah, that's so it's now a yeah, logical constant. Possibly the um, cosmological terms. Yeah, I wish not to spend too much yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, there, there are many possible, probably, solutions. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 excuse me, is it known? Is there any theorem which says that we know all solutions of the equation rigid tensor is equal to lambda no. No, times no, 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 Emphatic? Very much not. <laughs> Emphatically not. But for some principal reason, or we are just too stupid? Oh, you can't for, for many of them. This is true. true. This is true. Uh, this is true. So, so this was the answer I am clearly unable to following, understand. Following that question, uh, the theorem of Goldberg and Sachs is also a means of finding certain special... Certain class of the yes. solution, okay. It tells you something about possible okay, solutions. Okay, great. That's it is why one of the reasons why it's yeah. useful. But I just wanted to remark that uh, this algebraic, algebraic specialty of the uh, vial curvature has an analog uh, in the case of electromagnetism, and the analog is simply a null uh, electromagnetic field. So uh, this is something that might, for example, indicate that there is radiation or some other interesting symmetric uh, behavior. OK. Uh, so the third ingredient is a congruence of null geodesics. I assume we, we know what geodesics are, and we know what it means for them to be now. Those are just light rays. So a congruence is a three-parameter family of such geodesics that foliates out. So in other words, through every point of your space-time, there is precisely one of such curves. So it, it is this is truly important to know what this tensor Petrov type other than I or this one? Will be I, will, I will explain that in a few slides. Or I don't know. I will explain it that depends for what purpose. Purpose. Not for purpose. I promise. No, for purpose of understanding what will be further. I will. I will. Honestly, will I will explain, explain that. So, we have a family of null geodesics, that means a family of light rays, okay? and for every point of our space-time, there is precisely one such light ray, one such null geodesic. This is what the congruence is. And now, a little bit of geometry. What does it mean for them to be shear-free? There are several ways to say that, but what I like uh, is the following. So you consider this family of curves, uh, you consider the tangent vectors to such curves. This gives you a uh, rank 1 distribution in the tangent bundle to your manifold. What you take now is, uh, well, those are now vectors. 
uh, you consider the annihilators of those vectors, so the subspaces of vectors that are orthogonal. So remember that a null vector is orthogonal to itself. So this annihilator includes k itself, and we can take a quotient. This is a rank 2 vector bundle, and for certain reasons it has a well-defined conformal class of inner products. So it sort of has an inner product up to scaling, and the sheer freeness means that if we flow along uh, those geodesics, along any vector field tangent to this congruence, uh, the flow of this vector field is going to preserve uh, this class of inner products. That's what it means. I'm not going to get much deeper into that, but this is how you can express it. Physically, it means that if you have this light trace yeah. and you put a screen orthogonal yes. into it, and you look at the sh and then you put some obstacle in the light trace, then you want <coughs> that, the shadow. that the shadow is conformally related to the shape of the of the obstacle. Exactly. So the so the so the shadow of the thing can be expanded and can be rotated, but it cannot have shear. So for example, an ellipse, a circle as an obstacle cannot circle. be cannot be an ellipse. Yeah. It can be expanded it can expand circle, it can be rotate. rotated circle, so but it cannot be so it's not the shear. property of a usual shadow. Yes, it is. It is. Yes, it is. No. Very much so. <laughs> no, no, because a circle can be easily... No, no but, but you want to put the obstacle perpendicular. Ah, 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 yes. So let me just say one more thing. Uh, so those shear-free congruences are, are a nice class of objects in the realm. Uh, they are associated with null electromagnetic fields by the Robinson theorem. And uh, in particular, they are, they are interesting to study from, from Minkowski space-time. Uh, where they can be described in terms of the twister correspondence. So, in particular, if, you, so if, if you've got this shear free congruence, you can produce a now electromagnetic field and the other way around, but now we are not interested in electromagnetism but in gravitation. So, uh, this is why we are going to relate them to the vial tensor, which is the field strength of the gravitational. Okay, so uh, now some developments of this theorem. So this is, there are some names here. So the, the, the original proof is very hard to read. The nice proof, the first nice proof of this theorem, appeared in the same year and was due to Newman and Penrose. And it was done in this uh, famous Newman-Penrose formalism. So the formalism is very efficient, but it doesn't really explain very much. So that's the main problem with that proof. And then there were some versions of this, of this theorem which generalized it. And uh, the latest paper that I'm going to refer to is the one by Lirovsky, Gober, and Hill, uh, which actually covers basically everything I'm going to tell you about. So actually, after I had figured out some um, of the things I'm going to tell you about, I realized that they were already in that paper, but maybe not so explicit. So uh, what can you do with a theorem? Uh, the first thing is to view it as a theorem not really about Lorentzian geometry, but about conformal geometry. Because, as I will explain later, most of the objects that you consider there are conformally invariant. And that will, in particular, weaken the vacuum condition. I will tell you about conformal geometry in a moment. The other thing we are going to do is to complexify. So uh, instead of considering uh, everything over the real numbers, what you typically do is that you uh, complexify the tangent spaces to your manifold, or you can simply assume that everything is holomorphic and defined over the complex numbers. And that's useful because then you, uh, once you obtain a general complex result, you can specialize it using different real structures to different signatures. So, well, the thing that you uh, know about uh, scalar products over the complex numbers is that there is no signature. Right? So, things become unified, and then you can specialize to different real signatures. So, uh, for instance, here, here's a table that tells you uh, what objects and what integrability conditions you see in different signatures. So, this is the original theorem. In Lorentzian signature, you've got a null geodesic congruence and the condition is shear freeness. This is what I just described. Uh, 
in the Riemannian signature, you get an almost Hermitian structure and the integrability condition is integrability in certain, the sense of integrability of the complex structure. And I guess that this is due to Pavel Mirovsky, right? Could be essentially right. This one, the observation that, that, that you get this version from the Goldberg Saxony as a Riemannian version. And in the neutral signature, you get a distribution of null planes. And the integrability condition is just the usual Frobenius condition of involutivity. The neutral signature means 2 2. 2 2. 2 pluses, 2 minuses. And this is how it's going to look like also in the complex case. It, it doesn't have any physical sense, right? Well, no. Plus it has a very, yeah, but it's very convenient mathematically because. In what sense? In what physical application? Well, I, I wouldn't go into that. Yeah, I, I agree that it's probably not interesting physically. What is interesting about it is that you, you, we can write the format that but I, I agree, but I'm No, but the, okay. I'll, I'll, okay I'll just, I since I can tell you what you get in neutral signature, then why don't I say that? So that's why I said that. Uh, mathematically, it's interesting. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to tell you today is a sort of an interpretation of, of, of uh, this approach with a potential <coughs> generalization. So let's pass to conformal geometry. So instead of a Riemannian or Lorentzian structure on a manifold, I'm going to consider a conformal structure on a manifold. So a conformal structure is an equivalence class of metric tensors, where I say that uh, two metric tensors are equivalent if you get one by rescaling the other by some positive real function, which for convenience we write in this way e to negative 2 phi, or phi is some real function on the manifold. So in other words, instead of considering a single metric tensor, I consider just an equivalence class, where a rescaled metric is equivalent to, to the original one. So just as in Riemannian geometry, the basic invariant of such a geometry is the Riemann tensor, the curvature of the levi chiquita connection, uh, such a basic invariant for conformal geometry is the Weyl tensor. Tell you a bit about the right tensor a bit later, how it looks like in our four dimensional case. In any case, uh, if you choose a particular metric in this equivalence class, you can decompose the uh, Riemann tensor of this metric, I write it symbolically, into the Weyl tensor and the Ricci tensor. So the way you do that is that the Weyl tensor is a totally trace free part of the Riemann tensor doesn't really matter that much. The point is that it depends only on the conformal class. And this is to be understood uh, sort of symbolically. Those tensors really live in, in somewhat different spaces. But you can form such a combination by means of certain linear maps. Uh, what else? Well, the null directions and also the unparameterized null geodesics of a particular metric G depend only on the conformal class. So it's pretty clear that uh, the null directions depend only on the conformal class. If you rescale your metric, then it doesn't change the notion of being null. But actually, the geodesics, the null geodesics, are also the same, are, are also preserved. So for, in particular, our Shiyu free congruence of uh, null geodesics is a concept that is uh, conformally invariant. <coughs> Okay, well, did I want to go there already? Well, okay, I don't want to shock you with spin-offs immediately, but, but let's do that. So now I want to tell you how uh, the four-dimensional viral tensor looks like, and I'm first going to do that at a single point. So I'm just going to, uh, remembering that I decided to complexify everything, I'm going to consider a four-dimensional complex vector space V. I'm going to introduce a conformal structure on it, and tell you how an algebraic tensor, whose algebraic type is the same as the Weyl tensor's type, looks like. So a nice observation is that uh, to give a conformal class of quadratic forms on the vector space, in other words, to give a quadratic form up to rescaling uh, on the vector space, is the same as to identify this vector space with a tensor product of two two-dimensional complex vector spaces. It's just a nice thing about representation theory, really. And then those two uh, are the spaces of spin-offs. And the reason why it works this way is that 
uh, if you consider two copies of the general linear group uh, acting on those two dimensional spaces, you can make it work on P, and this way you get a double cover of the conformal or orthogonal group. Moreover, if you choose a non degenerate skew by linear forms on those uh, two dimensional spaces, this is the same as choosing a particular quadratic form and an orientation on your four dimensional vector space. So if you choose those uh, skew forms on spin out spaces, then you reduce those GL groups to SL, to special linear groups, and you get the familiar double cover of SO4. Right, two copies of SL2. Everything is over the complex numbers, so this is why this is not SU. Okay? Those are all complex new groups. Okay, now we can use this pair of uh, spin-on spaces to describe some objects associated with uh, the space V. So the ones I want to consider are the following. First of all, one observation is that uh, the set of null <coughs> planes in V can be written as the disjoint union of <coughs> projectivizations of those two spin-on spaces. So null planes are simply two-dimensional <coughs> spaces in V which are completely null. So in other words, the uh, quadratic form is trivial on them. Over the complex numbers, you always get plenty of such null planes. So the space of all such null planes will be uh, identified with the union of two uh, Riemann spheres. Right? Those, uh, those plus and those minus are two-dimensional complex vector spaces. If you projectivize them, you get uh, CP1s. Uh, complex projected lines, or if you prefer, Riemann spheres. So that's one identification that we want to use. <coughs> there is another <coughs> uh, which describes the vital <coughs> tensors. So if I consider tensors on V, which have the type of symmetries that the vial tensor has, then it turns out that all such tensors live in the direct sum of such two uh, fourth symmetric powers of the duals to those two uh, spin-off spaces. I will say how to think about it in a moment. But in particular, your particular vial tensor can be then decomposed into two pieces. One of them lives here, the other lives here. There is a nice uh, electromagnetic analogy with this decomposition. Namely, electromagnetic field can be decomposed into right-handed mm -hmm. helicity and left-handed, right. and this is precisely right. what it yes. is. Yes. Left-handed and yes. right-handed radicals. Or as uh, people say here, uh, self-dual and anti-self-dual uh, parts of the bile tensor. But the thing I wanted to emphasize is that if you recall some multilinear algebra, if you have an object in the fourth symmetric power of the dual to some vector space, and this is the same as a homogeneous polynomial of degree 4 of that space. So what that means is that you can think of the two components of the vial tensor as two polynomials, homogeneous poly polynomials of degree 4 on those two vector spaces, as, as plus and as minus. So in the end, if you only think of uh, those, uh, say, psi plus, the self-dual part of the vial tensor up to scaling, it defines a quartic in this complex projected line. So uh, this thing is a complex one-dimensional projective space. This thing can be thought of as a degree four homogeneous polynomial. So it cuts out some sub-variety or a sub-scheme, if you prefer, in that uh, projective space. And this uh, sub-variety, let's say is a quartic. And I want to think about this quartic as four points with multiplicity. Okay, so if you think of the Riemann sphere and you consider a... Uh, <coughs> if you think of the Riemann sphere as the projectivization of, of uh, this two-dimensional complex vector space, and if you consider a uh, homogeneous degree two polynomial in two variables, then it will cut out, in general, uh, four points on the sphere. But some of those points might coincide. So I'm going to count them with multiplicity. So this is the, the bottom line here. That, uh, say, the self-dual part of the vial tensor up to scale corresponds 
to a configuration of four points on this one complex dimensional projective space where I count the points with multiplicity. So, so the, now the, the, the points are just zeros of this four strand yes. polynomial? Yes, yes, yeah, I should accept it. Thank you. Yes, that's what I should accept. When I say that it cuts out, I mean that I consider the zeros of this polynomial. So now you can use that to classify those tensors, because you can classify different configurations of, of four points. So this is a, a, rough configure, a rough classification of quadrics in CP1, but it's good for our purposes. This is just is to remind us that plus is called self-dual, minus is called anti-self-dual. And here are the Petrov types. So once again, my vial tensor, if I consider it at a point, uh, if I consider, say, only the self-dual part, it corresponds to uh, some quartic in CP1, so on the Riemann sphere. So those are four points with multiplicities. So I can consider different cases. I can have four distinct points. I could have, say, three distinct points and one of them with multiplicity two. I could consider a single point with multiplicity four. So those different cases have different names in that classification. And in the end, there is also type O, which simply means that the uh, biotensor is zero. In that case, it doesn't cut out anything or you could say that it cuts out everything. Uh, those arrows indicate uh, specialization, the direction of specialization. So those are the Petrov types. And everything was complex here, but if you consider the classical case, so the real Lorentzian signature case, then actually the anti self dual part of the biotensor is complex conjugates to the self dual part. So really there is only one component to consider, and in that case this is what would the Petrov type of a classical biotensor is. There's only one component to consider. Uh, in the complex case, we have two components. So we have two Petrov types. We have a Petrov type of the self-dual part and of the anti-self-dual part. You consider them separately. And from now on, I'm going to focus on the self-dual world. I guess that Plebinsky used to use the, name, use the words heavenly and inferno, celestial and inferno yet another terminology. So that was at a single point, and now I'm going to consider that globally. So I return to my sort of complexified space-time. So that's a conformal four-dimensional manifold. I complexify its tangent spaces, and I apply the previous discussion. So what I get is the following. I consider uh, if you recall the previous slide, the space of self-dual null planes at a point was identified with a Riemann sphere, with a complex projective one-dimensional space. So now I, I have it at every single point, so I put those together into a fiber bundle, and I get a bundle of self-dual null planes, I call it curly C. It's a fiber bundle with fiber CP1. And by this description, sections of this bundle correspond to distributions of self-dual null plates. I'll draw a picture in a moment. Moreover, now I have the vial tensor defined everywhere, so at every point of the manifold, in the fiber of this bundle of null planes, I have my quartic, which I described before. So this configuration of four points with multiplicity. So I can now make a picture, which I didn't really want to prefer using the computer. I didn't know how to do it nicely. So here's my hand. I live in the complex world, so I'm going to think of those fibers as actually one dimensional, one complex dimensional. So uh, that's my bundle curly C over M. Here's a point P. Here's a fiber, and in that fiber, generally, I would expect to have four points, which correspond to the quartic cut out by the biotensor. Can this change going from a point to a point? This is this is what I what, what I wondered, and I never really thought deeply enough about that. Can change. Can change. Right, but. Yeah. But which way? It, it can only... But there is some upper semi-continuity or lower semi-continuity, right? It can only right? be more general, right? 
if you just if you specialize, it can specialize, right? Yeah. Yeah. It can That's go. Two points can go yeah. on this. Yes, yeah. it can collapse. Yes. yes. So in general, you expect such a picture, but you might, for example, get a double piece here and maybe a double piece here. That would be type D. But they come together. And now sections of this bundle correspond to uh, fields of now planes. So if I have some section, maybe it passes through those points, maybe not. I don't know. If I form such a section, that, then in other words, I have chosen a now plane at every point of my mind. So this is what this bundle describes. For some reason, I guess I missed the place where I was supposed to give it a name. Uh, so the name is the following. Uh, I'm going to call points in those particles, so those violet points in my bundle. Uh, and, well, those points correspond to certain self-dual null planes, and I'm going to call them principal self-dual null planes. So principal self-dual null planes are those that correspond correspond to zeros of this fourth degree polynomial that corresponds to the biotensor. Okay, so uh, here's how you can find the goldberg sachs theorem in this language. Uh, we consider once again a conformally Einstein fourfold, and we consider uh, a distribution of self-dual null planes in the complexified tangent bundle. So uh, you could think of n as being of arbitrary uh, signature that doesn't really matter once you complexify. So once you complexify, you've got those uh, self-dual null planes. So you consider such a distribution. And now the following are equivalent. The first one is just the Frobenius condition on the distribution n. But it's sort of formal because you're not really going to typically to integrate that into leaves, because this lives in some complexification of the tangent spaces. But nevertheless, it makes sense to write it algebraically. And the second condition is the following, that n is a distribution of repeated principal self-dual null planes, which means that at each point of my manifold, the null plane that my distribution gives me is a point in the quartic, so the violet point, with multiplicity at least two. So in other words, to say that uh, such a distribution corresponding to a section uh, is integrable in the sense of number one over there is the same as to say that, first of all, I've got a double point in every fiber. So I've got such a thick section here. And then my, my section is exactly this thick thing. Or it's one of those thick things if I've got more than just one. So this is how it looks like geometrically. So this way, uh, well, we recover the original theorem. Because of course, if we've got such a distribution with that condition, then a posteriori it means that uh, there exists uh, a uh, double point in the quartex at P at every point. And that, as we will say in a moment, uh, well, actually, as we already said, that means that uh, the vial tensor is algebraically special. That's what we've got in the Petrov classification. Right? So I forgot to mention that, but when we looked at the Petrov types, then type 1, which was the only non-special type, was the one where you had four distinct points in your quartex. So once you've got a point with higher multiplicity, it means that the Petrov type is not type 1. So it means that the biotensor is algebraically special. You, ne you never said why this theorem was that important in general relativity for perhaps you should just, just say one word about this. OK, this, this theorem was important because they wanted to find certain kind of solutions yeah, so to that's Einstein what I equations said in Ricci-flat yeah. Ricci -flat solutions to, in, in Lorentzian signature. And 
they were usually when you looked for solutions up to this 1960s, you were assuming that the that, 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 that your metric that you are looking for satisfies certain symmetry assumptions. But here they assumed something different. They assumed that there is some uh, preferred, preferred family of null rays in the space time because they wanted to, 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 to describe they wanted to describe gravitational radiation. So from this gravitational radiation this assumption, expect. they expected right. that there should be family of certain lights. And then they, if they, if they, if they assume that there is a certain family of, of these null lines, then they discovered that if the Ricci equation, Ricci flatness equations are imposed, then the wide tensor of the of the of, of this metric of this ansatz should be special. And this speciality of Y simplified the Einstein equations enormously. The, 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 it, it simplified the Einstein equations on this ansatz that enormously that they were almost able to solve it to the very end. So they were almost able to find all the Lorentzian metrics which were richly flat and having this congruence. So it is why this theorem was that cool. important in general. Okay. So uh, I'm going to focus on telling you how to roughly construct a proof of the implication from one to two. So well, this theorem has two parts. You show that one implies two and that two implies one, of course. Uh, my impression is that going from 2 to 1 is simpler, going from 1 to 2 is somewhat more interesting, so that's what I'm going to tell you about. And that's also what is non-trivial in terms of generalizing. Well, okay, so now that we know what we want to show, let us fix a section of this bundle of self-dual null planes corresponding to such a self-dual null plane distribution. We want to show that if we assume involutivity of this distribution, we are going to get algebraic specialty of the biotensor. I'm going to sketch that argument. So the first thing is that, well, it's not that convenient to work with uh, the Riemanns here without some coordinate. So uh, on each of those fibers, those are just CP1s, we choose a meromorphic coordinate, so just a, a meromorphic function, we call it Z on each of those fibers, so that our section zeta is given by Z equals zero. Okay, so in other words, we uh, identify each of those fibers by means of that uh, coordinate with C union infinity in such a way that well, let's say if that was our section zeta, then this would be the point zero over here. North pole. Yes, exactly. Right, so we align the north poles along the section. And well, this choice is unique up to such restricted Möbius transformations. So we want to keep that point, but otherwise we can uh, uh, rescale. We can perform such a fraction of linear, uh, linear transformation. So the only thing we don't do is that we don't add anything in the numerator. This keeps zero in place. And now we do the following. Uh, so recall that the cell dual, let's focus Excuse on the cell dual. Is part. this the formula which is written, which you call a Möbius transformation? Yes. Great. No, I learned something. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is a special Möbius transformation because it doesn't no, no, have... No, 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 the, 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 I, I just wanted to know yes. whether this is what... The, 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 this is what the, I would call a Möbius transformation. No, well, never mind. I just wanted to know whether yes. this is what the called. Yes. Yes. All right, so, uh, we recall that our self-dual part of the vial tensor was a fourth degree homogeneous polynomial on this... Uh, two-dimensional vector space, which we then projectivize to get the Riemann sphere. So we can now, using that coordinate, we can express it as a degree four polynomial in that coordinate z, with some coefficients, psi zero, psi one, up to psi four. So we do that uh, in every fiber. So this coordinate z is defined on every fiber, and those little size uh, are simply complex valued functions on our manifold. And they satisfy some transformation rules. So let me describe that very briefly. First of all, if I rescale the metric, then they also rescale. 
Second, uh, if I trans if I use this Mobius transformation here to change my coordinate, I get that psi zero transforms in such a linear way. Moreover, if psi zero is zero, then psi one transforms trivially, and then you can go further. If say psi zero, psi one are zero, then psi two transforms in a nice way, and so on and so on. I will just use those first two terms because, after all, well, psi zero is the value of uh, this violent tensor at my point zero. So what it means is that uh, the uh, distribution n is principal. In other words, in other words, the vial quartic vanishes on it if and only if psi zero is zero. And furthermore, it is repeated if psi one is zero, because then if both psi zero and psi one are zero, then well you uh, get a double point because you get a non-reduced polynomial. Repeat that in your previous terminology is multiplicity yes, two. Yes, yes, two. Yes, yes. I think I used both. Okay. So what we want to do, in other words, is to show that if n satisfies the involutivity condition, the Frobenius condition, then psi zero and psi one are zero. Showing that psi zero is zero will be easy. Showing that psi one is zero will be almost as easy. But to do that, I have to introduce one uh, concept, namely vial connections, which is as nice as Levi-Civita connections, or maybe even nicer. So uh, you know that in Riemannian geometry, once you've got a metric, you've got the unique Levi-Civita connection. Uh, so it's the unique torsion-free connection that preserves the metric tensor. Crystal. Crystal. Yeah. Crystal symbol. So uh, I will say that a connection uh, in the tangent bundle is vile for the conformal class G, and I forgot to write that it is supposed to be torsion free, so I add that now. Tor torsion free there. Uh, it is called vile if it preserves the conformal class in the following sense, in the obvious sense, I guess, the only reasonable sense, namely if you uh, take any representative of this class, so some particular metric tensor, and if you differentiate it along some vector field using such a connection, well, you should get something proportional to the tensor. So this is what makes sense for the conformal class, because of course it doesn't make sense to uh, require that for every single uh, representative of this class. So if you choose a particular metric uh, tensor, then the Levi-Civita connection of that metric tensor is a vial connection, but uh, there are vial connections which are not maybe Chibita connections of, of any uh, metric tensor. So this gives us a nice broad class of connections. So there is a price to pay, there is no unique vial connection, there is a whole set of them. Actually, the, the set has a nice structure, but I'm not going to speak about that. But this is a class of connections that's naturally associated with this conformal class, and it's the best you can get. So, once you choose a sound vial connection, uh, as usual, it has a curvature, it has a Ricci tensor, and actually in conformal geometry you use a trace corrected version of the Ricci tensor, which is called the Houghton tensor, and it's called Rho, it's capital Rho, for a certain reason. So, in other words, there's just Ricci tensor with some part of the trace subtracted, or added, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. So, once again, Sort of symbolically, you can write as before that the uh, curvature tensor decomposes as the vial curvature, which is this nice invariant tensor, plus uh, some version of this Houghton tensor. So this once again is sort of symbolic because those tensors live in different spaces. You have to apply some linear transformation to, to this row. So before I had the formula for a Levi-Civita connection, this is a general formula for any, uh, I'm just rewriting this formula, but now for, a, for any vial connection. But so, the vial tensor is the same. Yes, exactly, so that's exactly the point. So uh, this is once again why this class of connections is uh, a good class of connections, because they allow us to calculate uh, the vial tensor, which is an honest invariant of the conformal structure. So, for example, here you've got a nice criterion that a vial connection is a Levi-Civita connection for some metric tensor in the conformal class, if and only if uh, this Houghton tensor is symmetric, 
which means that the Ricci tensor is symmetric, which tells you that for general vial connections, the Ricci tensor is not necessarily symmetric, something that might seem odd at first. So ones with a symmetric Ricci are actually negative determinations. OK. So uh, let's put those things together. We start with a nice lemma. And it's the following. If I take a distribution of self-dual null planes on my manifold, then to say that it is involutive, that it satisfies the uh, Frobenius condition, is precisely the same as to say that there exists a vial connection which preserves uh, this distribution, which is a more convenient condition for, for certain reasons. So. Involutivity of my distribution, which was one of the uh, conditions in the goldberg sachs theorem, can be equivalently expressed in terms of the existence of such an adapted vial connection, a vial connection which preserves my distribution. So I wouldn't be able to find a levity beta connection with this property, but it turns out that I'm always able to find a vial connection with this property. And now we are going to use such a vial connection. There is still plenty of them. There is definitely more than one. We are going to use one of such vial connections, assuming that my n is involutive, and we are going to do some computations involving curvature of this connection, in the end to conclude that the vial tensor is algebraically special, because we can compute the vial tensor from such a vial connection. So well, I'm going to. Uh, not to spend too much time on that, but I just want to show you what sort of calculation you do. Uh, so you know that you have this vial connection which preserves the distribution. So if you compute the curvature, then also the curvature tensor, if you uh, plug into it two vectors, two arbitrary vector fields, well, then it will give you some uh, linear endomorphism of the tangent bundle it is also supposed to preserve the distribution. So it gives you a restriction on the curvature. So that gives you, it tells you that the curvature tensor has values in the subalgebra that preserves uh, this distribution. In other words, at each point preserves your self-dual null plane. So this action on the left is not differential at oh. all? No, no, right, yes. So it's it's a, yes, this is a tensor, right? This one looks like it was differential, but, but this is a tensor. Right? So this is a linear action. So what this tells you is, in other words, that uh, this object, the curvature tensor with two vector fields plugged into it, this is a, a section of the bundle of endomorphisms of the tangent bundle. And it is supposed to become 0 if you project it over here. In other words, if you apply it to some section of n, and then you project it to the quotient by n you get a 0, which is exactly the same as saying that if you apply it to some section of n, you get a section of n. <coughs> I just want to express it this way, uh, because I will use it on the next slide. So what I said so far is that uh, there is a restriction on the curvature of this adapted bioconnection. Algebraic. Yes, an algebraic, a linear restriction, vanishing of some component of it. So here's the next lemma. So indeed, let's assume that uh, after you plug two vector fields into the curvature tensor, what you get is in that kernel, so it preserves the distribution. Then, as I promised, first of all, psi 0 is 0. So I already know that my uh, distribution had to consist of principal null planes. And the second one is also funny. It tells you that if you restrict the row tensor, so the row tensor looks just like the Ricci tensor, because you could write it with two lower indices, so you can plug two vector fields into it. So if you take two sections of uh, your distribution and you plug them into the row tensor, it can be computed in terms of psi 1. Here, epsilon is uh, a skew by linear form uh, on the distribution, and it scales appropriately when you change the metric. There is only one such thing up to scaling, because this distribution has run two. So 
So it's just like on a two-dimensional vector space, you've got only uh, one skew by linear form up to scale. So the bottom line is that we've already we already know that psi zero is zero. We would like to show that psi one is also zero. What we know so far is that it is related to part of the row tensor. So this is something unusual. This is not something you would get, say, from Ganke identities. This only happens because, first of all, we have assumed uh, our distribution to be uh, integrable, and then we assume that we work with an adapted bioconnection, a bioconnection adapted to that distribution. So one way of getting psi 1 equals 0 to think is to think rho equals 0. Yes. That's one assumption that can make the yes. job, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, this is, but then you would make this assumption about the row tensor or the Ricci tensor of some very weird yeah. uh, adapted bioconnection. But it indicates what, that you should assume something about the Yeah, well, this is the first thing you could, you, 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 you could try to do, but uh, the row tensor doesn't transform that nicely, and you want a statement that looks like a uh, conformal Einstein condition or something weaker than that. So this is not yet the way to go. Uh, well, just the proof of the lemma simply uses the fact that you can express the curvature in terms of vial and the round tensor, and then you know that uh, the image of that with two vector fields plugged in in this guy should be zero, so that's why you get some linear relation between vial and fro, and this is this linear relation. Okay, so uh, what you've got so far is that the distribution is principal, in other words, uh, the vial tensor as a quartic vanishes on uh, the corresponding section, and we've got this relation between psi 1 and part of the row tensor. Very well, so now let's do a calculation. Okay, so what I got in the last line of my lemma was this nice equation. This equation is true uh, on the tensor product of the dis distribution with itself. So think of those tensors as by linear objects, objects that accept two vector fields that you can plug into them. So if you take two vector fields from the distribution n and plug them into this expression, you get zero. Okay, so what we do now is to differentiate, that's what you usually do, differential geometry, to uh, get some conclusions. Okay, so we differentiate, and now we restrict that once again to uh, the distribution. So we want to differentiate along uh, a vector in the distribution, we use our uh, adapted via connection to differentiate things. Epsilon is invariant. So now, uh, what we are going to do, we are going to anti symmetrize the, those first two slots. So on indices, you would just write brackets. So this out is going to, going to mean alternation in the first two slots. The reason why we do that is that actually now we see that what we've got this way can be rewritten in a different form. So first this one. If you take the row tensor, you differentiate and you anti-symmetrize the first two indices, what you get is the so-called cotton tensor. The cotton tensor is a much nicer invariant than row actually, it transforms very nicely. So it's an invariant frequently used in the form of geometry. So this is called the cotton tensor of Nabla, of our bioconnection. And here, there is a funny identity. Well, that was just uh, epsilon. So just this skew, this unique after scale skew by linear tensor. And it turns out that if you take a, a vector, you tensor it with this epsilon, and you alternate, what you get is just the same thing, but with a, with a negative sign in front of it, uh, with those factors swapped. That's sort of nice. This is the same. So now we've got a relation between the derivative of psi 1 and the cotton tensor. So let's go further. We rewrite that. So this lives on that bundle. I'm almost done. It's going to be nice now. So we are going to differentiate once again. In order to spur you the indices, I'm going to plug in subsections into it. So I differentiate once again, so I've got two de derivatives, two covariant derivatives here. I've differentiated my A nabla, and then I plug into it some y. I should put brackets around that. I'm not differentiating this y. Okay, and now I'm going to anti-symmetrize. 
So, well, if you take two uh, covariant derivatives and you anti-symmetrize, what you get is the curvature tensor. So on the left, left hand side, I can write the curvature evaluated on x, y and acting on psi 1. You'll get about the epsilon. And here I just got this anti-symmetrized combination of those terms. So now I have to figure out how the curvature tensor acts on such a thing as psi 1. So recall that this psi 1 had some transformation rule when you uh, change the metric. So it's really a section of some, of some line bundle and the uh, curvature acts non-trivially on psi 1. It's not just a function. And it turns out that it acts by means of the row tensor evaluated on x and y, but x and y are in N. So the row tensor of x and y is simply psi 1 times epsilon of x and y. Mm -hmm. So what we've got this way, now I'm going to write that in indices, so I guess it's no longer possible to write it this way, uh, becomes such an expression. How come that this is impossible to write? Well, it is possible, but then it's impossible to fit it on a single slide, I guess. I recall that we are already at the second derivative of curvature metric, yeah. which is at fourth derivative of well, the, the uh, curvature tensor, well, which is at fourth derivative of the metric. It is inconvenient no, because I, I, I was flabbergasted by the statement that it's impossible to write it in this super duper notation. I would never write it. That, I mean, that I mean, I was just completely shocked. I mean, my. my, my my admiration for this new mathematics was shattered. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what we get is a, an equation which relates uh, the square of psi 1 to this expression in derivatives of the cotton tensor. So, in other words, we've got some expression that is quadratic in psi 1. On the other hand, this cotton tensor well, you could ask why this is better than the expression that related psi 1 to rho. The point is that the cotton tensor transforms nicely when you change the vinyl uh, connection. So, let's get back to the theorem. What we wanted to do is to have some assumption which looks like, say, conformally Einstein. So, this is something that you express in terms of the levi civita connection of some metric, where you simply say that uh, well, the, in this case, it's Houghton tensor, all the Ricci tensor has to be proportional to the metric. So this is expressed in terms of a Levi-Civita connection, and our previous formula was in terms of this vinyl connection. So fortunately, there are formulas that allow you to transform uh, those rho and a when you change the vinyl connection. And moreover, uh, if you consider vinyl and cotton as some composite tensor, this thing transforms linearly when you change the uh, connection. So it will produce a nice formula. And in the end, once you use this transformation formula to rewrite everything in terms of the Levi-Civita connection, what you get is precisely the statement that we wanted to get, only a with a certain weaker hypothesis instead of being conformally Einstein. The theorem is as follows. Uh, so let n be a distribution of self-dual null planes, which satisfies this uh, Frobenius condition. And suppose that the cotton tensor of uh, the Levi-Civita connection of some metric tensor uh, vanishes when you restrict it to the distribution. So it's only certain components that have to vanish. Then those vital scalars, psi 1 and psi 0, are 0. In other words, uh, the vial tensor is algebraically special. So in particular, uh, if our metric G was Einstein, in other words, it satisfied that one, then the uh, cotton tensor would be simply zero. So in particular, if uh, M is an Einstein, or conformally Einstein manifold, then this is true. But this is a much weaker hypothesis. This is really nothing new. This is also in the, in the paper of uh, uh, and, and others. Yeah, and this is also it is in a book by Penrose. Yeah. But this is this is one of those versions by this is this Kunt version of the yeah. yeah. This was very it was it was obtained immediately yeah. after yeah, yeah, yeah. two. Right. Right. So this is what you get in the end this way. But the advantage is 
I don't know if you will appreciate it, but advantage I appreciate is that uh, this whole reasoning is done in a way that doesn't use this very special formalism of Newman and Penrose, but only uses some very natural and invariant objects from conformal geometry, which do arise in on every conformal manifold in every dimension, and also for certain other uh, types of geometries. I will say about this in a moment. Let me just tell you what you really get. So when you do this transformation, remember we had this previous uh, formula with psi 1 square. Once you transform everything uh, in terms of the levi civita connection, what you get is once again a term that's quadratic in psi 1. Here you've got the alternation of the row tensor, but the row ten tensor is symmetric for a levi civita connection, so that's zero. And we assume that this one is also zero. This epsilon is a certain uh, form. And there are some epsilons here, but I, I omitted them. So what you really get is once again such a quadratic condition, but of course, since psi 1 is uh, well, a section of a line bundle, or if you prefer, simply a scalar, saying that the square is zero means that psi 1 is also zero. It is sort of an identity that this, that this one one differential yes. order higher so than the exactly other identity. what I was about to say oh, sorry. in the remarks. So the first remarkable thing is uh, that we have to differentiate the curvature at once. So you might imagine that once you start differentiating the curvature, then Bianchi identities come into play when you do it once. And then already the Bianchi identities are an integrability condition for the uh, structural equations of Cartan, so for the uh, curvature. So you would expect that if you differentiate once again, you don't get anything new. But the point is that here, we, well, we really use the fact that we have some extra conditions, namely the existence of this uh, integrable distribution of null planes. So we had to go uh, beyond uh, the level of Bianchi identities. That's also why we've got the square of uh, the curvature. So we differentiated the curvature twice and alternated. So we really got curvature acting on curvature, but in a, in a non-trivial way. The other thing is that this is a very general method. You can apply it, in fact, to so-called almost Hermitian symmetric geometries. So the examples are higher dimensional conformal geometry, projective geometry, almost Grassmannian structures, and, and many others. The formalism looks almost the same way. The details are slightly different, uh, but you can, I will say that in a second, you can make it work using uh, this point. So I will make it already now. So the proper language to use here is to use representation theory of the conformal group. So I wanted to avoid that, since actually in this case it's uh, sort of tautological. So it wouldn't be clear why one would like to use it. But once you write it in terms of representations of the conformal group, one sees that it is immediate that you can generalize that to, say, higher dimensional conformal cases or those other almost Hermitian symmetric cases. And this is also a nice thing because uh, you can easily experiment with uh, representation theory using some computer algebra packages. So I use a package called V, and uh, you can quickly use it to check that indeed you do get some interesting uh, non-trivial sorts of uh, goldberg sachs theorems in higher dimensions. So you get some analogous conditions uh, for some part of the biotensor. In fact, if you, if you consider higher dimensional even conformal geometries, you still get objects like psi 0 through psi 4, only that they are not scalar, they are sections of some vector bundles. So you get some, in general, some quadratic condition on some tensor, not on a scalar. So it's not a simple vanishing condition, but it really is some algebraic condition on some component of the byte tensor. Uh, so just one more thing that I wanted to say. I, I didn't tell you about the opposite implication in the goldberg sachs theorem, but this is because it's been done in higher dimensions. Did I tell you about the other? Uh, using sort of similar similar methods, also also related to uh, conformal geometry and parabolic geometries. So he did that direction. So this is already done. And the last thing is that 
for the higher dimensional conformal cases, it's also attractive because it sheds some light on the algebraic structure of the value tensor. So people have been trying to come up with some useful, computable uh, analogs of the Petrov classification in higher dimensions. And I guess, uh, I don't know, maybe that was successful, maybe not, but there have been several attempts. So this leads to some other natural classification of bio tensors in, in higher dimensions. So uh, just to conclude, I expect new results uh, to come soon. And I think that generalizing the, this part of the theorem to higher dimensions uh, in the conformal case uh, is something that is very much doable. Thank you. What are the regularity assumptions that are needed here concerning the metric? Can it discontinue this, for example? Well, I, I always worked in this smooth case, but since you only so differentiate the twice, are allowed, uh, yes, yes, they are not forbidden. Since you only differentiate twice, you would probably get away with something like that, like C2. But well, I, I've never seen. Yeah, uh, I've never seen any, for, way for yeah. Yeah. I've never seen anyone discussing this issue for the goldberg sachs theorem. But when you have this uh, cross section, yeah. then it would yes. be yes. interesting yes. to know whether yes. this continues. Yes. Yes. Interesting yes. question. I have I have no idea. But I've also yes. never yes. seen yes. anyone considering yes. that in the, in the goldberg sachs in the classical yes. case. Yes. But this is a legitimate question. I don't know, I, I haven't seen it. Related to gravitational waves, yes. 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 Yeah. I've never seen anyone doing that. But what was the kind of discontinuity? The, the ones that are allowed by the uh, proper statement of she problems. Okay. Yes, but uh, yeah. almost at this space or? Because and, there are those uh, sheets uh, which yeah. provide the delta-like uh, delta -like, uh, curvature, non-trivial and rich, and which may be interpreted as a uh, sheet of math. Yeah, but this is but no, but this is I think the question was about sort of like uh, wave front. Wave front, exactly. Wave front. Wave front. So R is always, uh, the rich is always zero. Yeah. So the rich is always zero. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know anything about this. This continues. Rozumiem, żebyśmy się spodziewali nieciągłości właśnie w tensorze Weiler. Tak, no i w metryce, bo ją będziemy rozliczkować. Tak, tak. Ja rozumiem, że w związku z zmianą języka to są teraz wyniki, których się nie da już powiedzieć po angielsku. Tak, ale w tamtych się nie dało napisać po polsku. Może ja powiem. One comment. I I think that I I was involved in this Goldberg Sachs theorem business for about 30 years from up to now. And I even made some contributions to, this, to understanding of this theorem, but never in my life I tried to present a proof to anybody of this theorem. And this what he is doing, he, 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 that he has done today, is, it was really very courageous. I, 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 yes. I, I was really I believe, I believe we, we should be courageous enough to offer you the possibility of presenting this result to us, we would not anyway be unable to understand it. But at least you would be able to tell that you have presented it. It's no way. It's a horrible calculation and he somehow made some nice presentation of it. More comments? If not, we think again.